Hello, this is the Clay Golem. This is Foundry VTT version 12. And this is part of our automation series. We're going to look at another couple of functions in there. We're going to look at the optional flanking rule and attacking from a hiding position because these things are all part of MIDI QOL. Um, so before we get started on that, I just want to point out to you that MIDI QOL, we're on version 11.6.9. And if you are not on that version, next time you update, it will probably force you onto that version because and correctly, you want that <laughs> because this is the um, the, the version 12 MIDI uh, correct pathway you should be on. It's now in a position where it's the default. You will be automatically, in theory, moved over to that if you've not already done it. All right. That was a bit of a mouthful, wasn't it? OK, so um, what are we looking at? So I've got open here the MIDI QOL settings. Um, if I go into workflow flow if I go into workflow thank you very much <laughs> we're looking under the rules here and we're looking up these top two optional game rules I've got that ticked on and I've got check flanking advantage only so there are some convenient effects ones in here um, I'm just using the advantage only that's all what I want for this um, and just underneath that, you can see a block that's talking about unseen invisible attackers have advantage or disadvantage on attacks. Uh, and there's some options in here. I'm using rules as written. OK, so if you if your player is hiding, they get advantage on a target that doesn't know that they're there. That's what I'm using. Uh, hidden attackers have advantage, dis disadvantage on attacks. So I check that hidden status. Um, and force vision when attacking, I've got that on. So checked, it behaves as if all tokens have vision enabled. So I do not have vision enabled on any of my monster tokens. Um, because if they're in a really dark room, I, I, I can handle that. But if uh, I've got token vision on, I can't see what's going on when I select them. So I don't want to do that. So those are the two things we're going to test. Um, and just check, well, actually, we're not going to test because I've already tested them. I'm going to show you how they work. But those are the settings we are looking at. And now just before we do that, because, you know, like to make things slightly awkward, I have been continuing going through my uh, GM tested testing spells, whether they are from Gambits, whether they are from DDBI imported correctly or whether they're Chris's pre-made stuff. I have continued doing that in the background. It's a long, long process. We have discovered a couple of things not quite working right um, and Gambit and Chris's team have fixed those really quite quickly. So, you know, this is serving a couple of purposes. One, I'm testing it's going to work for my games, but two, I'm able to give feedback to those guys and let them know where things are slightly janky or just just not working. So we've got quite a lot of stuff. We've got Barbarian stuff, that's all good. We've got Cleric stuff, Eyes of Night, I'm going to show you in a second. We've got a couple of fighter bits. We've got Arcane Recoveries working, obviously. We've got the Lanterns and Torches we've looked at, Polar Master. We've got some racial abilities that are working. Um, and we've got a whole bunch of spells. Now, there's so many spells, they take quite a long time to kind of go through and check all the connotations and things like that. But we've got some good stuff. Goodberry's just been updated. Um, it's lovely. It actually works as a spell. So when you cast it, it puts an item in your inventory. And when you use that item, it gives you a hit point back. It's, it's exactly as it should be. Witch Bolt's working lovely. Um, and we've got a couple of second level ones. So obviously, I'm prioritizing my player's stuff uh, and checking those work because I want to make sure that obviously they work. So what I would, did want to show you was this Eyes of Night. Let me get rid of you and open Silas here. So Silas is a first level cleric who has the Eyes of Night ability. Um, and what that does is means that Silas gets this rather large dark vision automatically, um, which is great. So it always has that. That's why we're greyed out because Silas has his dark vision on. But he can use that ability to give it to somebody else. So... Um, this dwarf doesn't need it. He's got his dark vision anyway. I don't have vision on for my orcs. But this is a this this character up here does not have um, does not have dark vision themselves. Wrong character. Put uh, open. 
Um, so this character does not have dark vision themselves. They're a variant human. Um, but Silas has used that ability uh, and now we've got eyes of night on this individual. So you can see they've got their dark vision working because of that. Now if I disable that, suddenly they can't see any of the other tokens because it's dark and now they can again. So it's beautiful. It works absolutely beautiful. So that's kind of the testing I'm doing is just casting that on a few people, making sure it works, etc. Um, but that's not why we're here, is it? I've got distracted again. All right, let's bring up our chat. You can see I've already got these guys in combat. Um, so a couple of things I want to show you first of all. Let's start off with the hiding. All right, so um, if we over here, we make a normal bow tack with this ranger. I know rangers aren't people's favorites, but there we go. A normal bow attack here against that orc. Not surprisingly, why did you use your action? Uh, your reaction oh because it wasn't your go um we've got a 1d20 plus three plus two plus another two because we have the fighting initiate archery on here so that's why they get so many bonuses um but we did a normal attack here 1d8 plus three damage all right let's actually move it to there, there we go. now if i add on the condition here of hiding okay so again, this comes from the, the Chris's pre-made effects tab. So we can apply it from there. There it is. All right, we can apply it from there if we want to. It's just I'm doing it from the right menu. We now have this character hiding. So let's do that same attack again against that same orc. There we go, that longbow. Because we've made attack, we've come out of hiding automatically. But our attack was 2d20, keep the highest, which is advantage, plus the three, plus the two, and then we did our damage. So that works absolutely beautiful. We can do the same with Silas over here. Make Silas hiding. Uh, I think I gave Silas a, a bow for this purpose. Shoot with that long bow, bam, again, we've got 2d20. So that is working absolutely beautifully, um, as is the using reactions, <laughs> because uh, it's not his go, but he has attacked on his go, so it's assuming that's an attack of opportunity which is just fine. Um, literally just those couple of settings in MIDI QL. Well, well. Now, that is an optional thing you, you may or may not want on, want on, depending how you do it. I'm going to have it on. It makes sense. It just, again, it just adds that smoother piece of automation to it, especially if I'm using NPCs um, for doing that stuff. But, right, so the other bit we wanted to look at, of course, was flanking. So we've only got this one dude here currently attacking. Let's uh, let's move to uh, this standby dwarf fighter and clear our log. Everybody's got dark vision on. So if this... Get out of here, you two. Come here, Thorg, my standby dwarf. So if my dwarf makes a normal attack, you know what you're expecting to see. Let's just do it with a hand axe. A 1d20 plus 4 plus 2. 1d6 plus 4 damage. Yep, that's exactly what we would expect. Now let's move Silas up next to this orc. Now what happens when we make exactly the same attack? I'm now rolling 2d20, keep highest. So I'm rolling advantage. In fact, it says it just above. Rolling advantage. And uh, in fact, actually... I rolled advantage and I got a natural 20, so it's done the double damage as well. <laughs> so extra chunky. But the point is, if there's more than one token next to it, then it is going to do that double. Uh, it's going to do that advantage, which is exactly what you want. So it's all these little things I'm testing to make sure they do as we would expect them to do. So we can go back to our ranger here after healing up our orc, and even at range, I'm not hiding. But because it's a ranged attack, I'm not getting that flanking bonus because that doesn't count. Um, and there's a few options in the uh, in the settings that you can have on for firing into melee as well. Let me just see if I can. Are they on there as well? Were they in exactly the same place? Um, they were in here. I know I saw them. Da, 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 da. Here we go. House rule ranged attacks at foes near allies have disadvantage. So you can turn that on as well if you want to. So that 
um, that ranger would have just had disadvantage firing into that melee because colleagues are there. Um, so those in melee are getting advantage for flanking. Those firing from range are getting disadvantage because they're trying not to hit their allies and stuff. In fact, let's pop that on. So uh, range attacks with allies within five feet of the target have disadvantage. Um, zero disables. So this is the range attack. Uh, so range attacks with allies, because it's I was expecting this to be a click on, click off, but it's not. It's a number. Range attack with allies nearby, five feet to the target have disadvantage. So I'm assuming that a, a zero is off and a one is on, which effectively is a tick box. So let's uh, let's try it. It's the best way to find out, isn't it? So in theory, then, with that switched on, just clear our chat, this attack should be at disadvantage. It's not. So there's something in that setting I'm not doing right. I didn't look at that setting before starting this video. Um, I just segued onto it. So it's not surprising that perhaps I've not got that quite right. Um, range attacks at foes near have disadvantage. Mm -hmm. So I may need to actually go back and look that one up to find out is, is it a distance is it is it within five feet or something is that what it wants <gasps> there we go right so yes so if they're within five feet so i want that to be the number of feet so you could house rule it by the looks of it um and say actually if any friendlies are within 10 feet uh, i'm not sure why you would want to do that I don't know why, um, but we, if they're within five feet, then it counts. So we have indeed made that attack at disadvantage and we have failed. So if you want to use that option, you can. What's interesting is what if I now hide this person? So we're now going to get advantage from hiding, but we're shooting into melee and get disadvantage. It should cancel each other out, rules as written. Let's check that. There we go. It did. We roll 1d20. So that is, and I've seen that before with various other things, it does indeed do that correctly. So if your character is hiding, you are going to get advantage. If you're in melee flanking, you're going to get advantage. If you're shooting into a melee and you've got friends in there, you're going to get disadvantage. Um, and you can turn any of those on or off as you like. Completely up to you. And this is the type of automation that I really like. Um, I, not The dice rolling for monsters is great, but I really like it when it is doing it like this for, um, and it's doing those calculations for us. And it stops me as the DM having to think too hard about, oh, hang on a minute, who's got advantage, who hasn't? Because it's kind of doing it for me, which is lovely. I personally do use flanking. I like that because it encourages the players to think a bit more tactically in combat rather than um, we send in the tank who holds them still and everybody else runs around like a headless chicken um, shooting arrows into them and things. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, that works. That's fine. But it's not quite the same. It's like now they're thinking more strategically. And guess what? You can guarantee my monsters will be doing the same. They will be outmaneuvering. If they just send that one tank forward, that tank is going to get surrounded and absolutely get the crap kicked out of them <laughs> because everything's going to be attacking with advantage on them. Um, so they're going to have to be more sensible. They're going to have to think about how to do that. going to have to use more crowd control spells and abilities and things. Just makes combat more tactical. Um, and I think when you're using something like Foundry to play those games and you've got that visual representation of tokens, or if you've got minis, if you if you play with minis, traditionally I never did play with minis, um, it, it gives you that visual representation. It does make things more tactical and a bit more interesting. The house rule about disadvantage for shooting into melee, I'm on the fence about that. I've, it, actually, I'd be really interested to hear what your opinions are. Do you use that rule? Do you use it? Shooting into melee gives you disadvantage, or rather, you know, if you're if you've got friends there, um, because it in some ways it takes away it takes away some of the power of those ranged characters with bows and things like that. I mean, rangers are pretty weak anyway, and now I'm saying, hey, you can't even get advantage from hiding. 
you know, and it's going to be the same for the rogues. You can't get advantage from hiding if you're shooting into the melee, or melee, however you want to say it. Um, yeah, I'd be really interested to know your thoughts. I'm on the fence. I'm going to read your comments, and then I'm going to decide whether I'm going to implement that for my game or not. I think I'm going to default for not. Anyway, that's it for this one. Thank you for watching. Appreciate it. Comments, let me know. Take care. See you soon.